Greetings, ladies and gentlemen of the internet. This is the Rock and Roll Spot coming at you with the weekly TV roundup. We're a few days later than normal, but that's just simply because circumstances kind of got out of the way, out of hand during the week. Um, we'll start off with what I hope will simply be the first season finale of Constantine, and hopefully, hopefully, fingers crossed, not the series finale. Uh, the ep- episode opens with a man waking up three young women, who later save another young woman at an amusement park. The trio could to be married to the man man being the one who woke, woke them up, and invite the other young one to marry the man as well, she, and she agrees. As, <coughs> as the four leave, the man kills a security guard who sees him. Later, John is there talking to Detective Corrigan about the kidnappings as well as a dead policeman. John sprinkles holy water on the dead officer's body, revealing that the, the officer was branded by the Devil's Branding Iron, pointing to the uh, involvement of a Satanist. During this, the spirit of John's friend Gary possesses the corpse and informs John that there's a price on his head, which we discover uh, soon thereafter. Pop of Midnight means to collect. Also, Zed continues to have visions of Corrigan dead and cloaked in green, in green light. John, Zed, and Corrigan investigate the missing girl, who John dedu- deduces is, a, is a, meant to be a sacrifice. At the amusement park, John is attacked by a zombie set by Papa Midnight. The zombie is swiftly dispatched by Corrigan. Zed forces, forces a vision is able to find a clue to the girl's whereabouts. While there, John realizes that Papa Midnight is, well, tracking him. Meanwhile, the man's potential new bride prepares to, to marry him. As John pulls up to the, to the man's house, however, the new bride changes her mind and runs while exploring the house, John discovers that the man's other, other three brides are actually dead, and when they when they are woken, they are actually being woken from well from death. Shortly after meeting up with Zed and Corrigan, John tracks down the man and eventually talks Corrigan into letting him go, as John means to pin the killings on Papa Midnight. Later, Zed tells Corrigan about her visions of him after John and Manny have a chat. Manny frees Papa Midnight later on, telling him that John is off limits, and the, the Brujaria, who are behind the rising darkness, work for him. Well, that, so that's it for Constantine so for uh, this season, and hopefully we'll get more. Um, I gotta say, that ending, damn, I did not see that coming in the, at all. Wow. Uh, anyway, moving on to last week's episode of Arrow. The episode opens with what seems to be a fight between Sarah and Laurel, both in costume. It cuts to 48 hours earlier. Ollie and Roy run run into Laurel, and Ollie tells Laurel that she isn't ready to be running about in costume. Back at the Arrow Cave, Merlin tells Ollie that he needs to tell Thea his secret. At Star City Courthouse, Werner Zeidel, the new Count Vertigo, demands to face his accuser, the Arrow, when one of the Federal Marshals escorting him is dosed with Vertigo and starts shooting reporters until Laurel punches him out. That ends up being Felicity's favorite part of the broadcast. Ollie tells Thea that he's the Arrow. Instead of being mad, however, Thea understands his reasons for not telling her and thanks him for all he's done for the city. Upon learning that Merlin knew, however, Thea becomes mad at Merlin for manipulating her. At the Arrow Cave, Laurel gives Felicity a lead on the reporter who helps Idol escape. Ollie accuses Laurel of being addicted to the adrenaline from fighting crime. Uh, when Ollie and Roy find the reporter, he tells them that Zidal blackmailed him into killing the Arrow, which the uh, bomb seems to potentially do, at least from Zidal's viewpoint, from Zidal's vantage point, I should say. Laurel manages to track Zidal to the docks and gets a, a, gets a dose of vertigo, leading to her, to her fighting Zidal while hallucinating that it's Sarah. Ollie and Roy save Laurel and take her back to the Arrow Cave to detox her. Team Arrow has a brief breakdown, leading to Roy following Thea when she leaves with the DJ, and Ollie and Diggle discussing what happened while he was presumed dead over a drink. After Felicity gets a new lead on Zidal, Ollie asks Laurel to come with him as Roy cannot be found at the moment. Thea discovers that the DJ is an agent of Rachel Ghoul, leading to the two fighting until Roy, followed by Merlin, steps in. The DJ, the DJ ends up killing himself with cyanide. Ollie and Laurel manage to save Zidal's hostages while he sets the lab he's appropriated on fire. Laurel directs Zidal once again and once again gets herself dosed with 
Virgo, this time seeing her father as well as Sarah. Laurel eventually gets the upper hand and takes Zidal down. Ollie goes to check on Thea while Laurel goes to talk to her father, finally telling him that Sarah is dead. Captain Lance, before this, Captain Lance tells Laurel that he knows that she's the new canary. The two of them, after Laurel tells Cap the captain of, about Sarah, have a little, a little cry, of course. And in the end of the episode, Merlin tells Ollie and Thea they must face their fears, which means that they're off to the island. Solid episode. Um, most of us are looking forward to uh, the next episode, which we'll have... Uh, oh, of course, flashbacks. Um, Ollie and... Ollie attempts to escape uh, Hong Kong uh, and is reacquired by Argus um, for information on on his handler, which he eventually does give up after being tortured. It turns out, however, that uh, he was lied to, though the handler still shows up. <clears throat> um, then uh, Waller takes Ollie back to Starling City. For what, for what reasons, we do not yet know. Um, moving on to the Street Star episode of The Flash. Opens with the aftermath of the firestorm explosion, revealing that both Ronnie and Professor Stein are separate again. As Star Labs, both are found to be running fevers of 100.6 degrees. Also, there was no radioactive fallout. Luckily. Joe tells Barry that he and Cisco, or what he and Cisco found at Barry's old house, leading Barry, Joe, Cisco, and Professor Wells to talk about the possibility of time travel. Uh, one of Iris's co workers tries to convince her to spy on Star Labs. Barry goes to talk to Professor Stein about time travel, who's exhibiting some strange, strange new personality traits, rather, which seem rather similar to Ronnie Raymond's. At the same time, General Eiling attacks Ronnie, who is saved by Barry and Caitlin. Um, however, Caitlin doesn't have to save both Barry and Ronnie, as General Eiling has come up with a weapon to use against the Flash. Barry puts Caitlin and Ronnie up with him and Joe, while Island reveals that he knows Barry is the Flash, mainly because of uh, him revealing his identity to Plastique. Wells turns Professor Stein over to Island, and the team at Star Labs uses Ronnie's link to Stein to track, track him down. Barry and Ronnie go to Professor Stein, and Barry is with a weaponized form of phosphorus, while meaning that he has to basically run extraordinarily fast to keep himself keep himself from burning up. Meanwhile, Ron and Fritz decide merge once again, this time of their own volition, which makes it easier to separate. Uh, Barry Bennett, however, Eileen uh, manages to uh, shut the fires from Matrix down briefly. However, Barry is able to reactivate it, and he and fires from return to Star Labs. Uh, Ronnie and Professor Stein opt to go to Pittsburgh as a colleague of, St colleague of Stein's there might be able to help him. Or help them, I should say. Uh, Barry tells Joe that he sees the images of the speedster fight as a lesson in what not to do when fighting Reverse Flash. Reverse Flash, revealing himself to Eiling as Professor Wells, kidnaps the general and leaves him in the sewer for Grodd. Which it was very cool to see Grodd. Giant telepathic gorilla. Alright, moving on to Gotham. It was with Bruce sleeping on a couch at the Wayne Manor, a notebook of his questions uh, pertaining to his parents' murder o open on his lap, as these include questions for uh, the, Wayne, the Wayne Industries board. Cut to Oswald's, where Penguin's mother is singing When You're Smiling, though not everyone is entirely happy. In fact, one person boos when she finishes, and Penguin ends up killing him. Finally, we see Fish adjusting to her new home, home so, so to speak. Uh, Gordon and Dr. Tompkins view, view a brawl at the circus between one of the clowns and one of the flying Graysons. Further investigation revealed that the fight was over the sideshow snake dancer, who, uh, whose body is found later on. Um, 
Fish manages to band all of the inmates that her in the prison she's being kept in together. Uh, telling them not all of them will survive their takeover, but those that do, those that die will die with dignity, and those who survive, well, yeah. Barbara returns to her apartment looking for Jim, but only finds Selena and Ivy, and the three kind of have a little girls' night in. Uh, the sideshow's psychic plate pays Jim and Leslie a visit, though Jim is skeptical. Also, side note, the, the psychic was played by a uh, character from Mark Margolis, who, uh, most, one of his more recent roles was, uh, that of, uh, um, Chuko's uncle in, uh, Breaking Bad. You know, the, uh, parallel, yeah, the wheelchair with the, uh, little nigger bell. Later that night, Jim and, uh, Gordon and Tom, Dr. Tompkins investigate the psychic's message as Dr. Tompkins had an epiphany about it over dinner. They managed to find the murder weapon, and Jim has the psychic brought in as well as the snake dancer's son, Jerome. Jim's meeting with the two reveals the psychic to be the boy's father and the boy to be the killer. Also that the boy has some very deep personality issues, as well as a very eerie laugh. Bruce meets with the Wayne Enterprises board, bringing up various unethical business practices and, in fact, even charges of uh, corruption. Zaz shows up at Oswald's and tells Penguin that Falcone isn't happy with how the club's being run, then gives him a now brainwashed Bush to help. Fish goes to meet the manager of the prison she's in while one of the guards stays with her fellow inmates. Um, anyways, moving on to Agent Carter. This being the next to last episode of the show. It was with Dr. Ochenko, the psychiatrist brought back from Russia, on a Russian battlefield in 1943. And he is identified there as being Dr. Fenhoff. Uh, he's, uh, he's asked to hypnotize a soldier in surgery as the medics have used up all their anesthetics. He succeeds, and the soldiers, the medics are able to amputate the soldier's infected leg. Susa interrogates Peggy and gets nowhere, and soon after, Thompson and Chief Dewey each take a crack at it and get just as far as Susa. Jarvis arrives at the SSR with a signed confession from Howard Stark, making a deal for Peggy's release. Later on, however, Peggy or Jarvis informs Peggy that the confession is a fake. Peggy catches Ochenko doing Morse code and tells him of her deed, and tells uh, Chief Dooley, Susa, and Thompson about her uh, investigation in the past few months, uh, as well as about the sample of Captain America's blood that she took from Stark. Uh, she's actually able to, when Chief Dooley first brings up how, asks her how she could run an investigation with all this time with him, with no one really noticing, she explains that unless she has their coffee, their lunch, their files, she's largely invisible around the office, which has been true. Uh, Thompson and Sousa end up believing her, and the two are then ordered to investigate the building Obchenko has been communicating with, which has the dentist's office that Dottie is in, or is using as a sniper's nest. Back at the S later at the SSR, Chief Dewey is hypnotized by Evchenko and takes the doctor to the lab where Evchenko takes one of the Stark crates and leaves Dewey with a vest. Susan and Thompson's team encounter Dottie, who kills one of the agents while escaping. Dottie picks up Evchenko with the crate in front of the SSR just, just before... Uh, Susan leaves the building. Susan Thompson leave, leave the building. Thompson lets Peggy and Jarvis out of the interrogation of Chief Dewey has locked them in while, while he was under the influence of Dr. Ochenko. The trio find the Chief wearing the vest, which is now glowing. Uh, Dewey takes Thompson's sidearm, shoots out a window, and jumps out of it just before the vest explodes. Little we'll miss Chief Dewey. Good, you're a good man. Dottie leaves a sword, which she purchased earlier with a, with a stolen item, a poison gas canister in a movie theater. The gas causes the audience members to become highly agitated and attack, and, then, and attack and brutally kill each other. And that's where the episode ends. 
moving on to Sleepy Hollow, as there was no episode of uh, Scorpion this past Monday. Uh, the episode was with Ichabod and Abby at a bookstore looking for some of the books they found in Jefferson's now destroyed private library. Soon after, various locals start exhibiting uh, strange abilities briefly, which abilities which could be linked to witchcraft. And in fact, are said to be similar to those of to powers they've encountered already in the series. Uh, Jenny t- tells Abby and Ichabod about her run with Frank Irving. Uh, Ichabod and Abby investigate the recent exhibition of power and discover that the bell of the town's, town center, which is supposed to be, has been replaced with one that cast from the same mold as the Liberty Bell. While doing some research, Ichabod discovers that the bell has various cult symbols on it and that it, uh, and that it could potentially be used in a uh, an awakening ritual, uh, Katrina and Henry join forces and plan to do an, to do said awakening ritual, as Henry tried initially but then failed, as he is not full witch but only half of a witch. Uh, but they plan to awaken the witch blood in every member, or everyone living in the city. Abby and Ichabod make a gunpowder charge to destroy the bell, a similar charge. Ichabod made during the Revolutionary War to destroy a bell also made from the same cat. It's cast from the, a similar bell, basically. When they go to destroy the bell, however, Irving tries to stop them. Jenny takes on Irving as Abby and Ichabod learn of Katrina and Henry's plan. Abby and Ichabod go after the bell again, and though the charge is planted, Abby and Ichabod get, get captured. The two manage to get loose and shoot Henry as well as the charge, bringing about Henry's death. For now, I would presume. Irving seems to be back to his old self once Henry dies. Uh, Katrina blames the Kaban for Henry's death and reads a spell from the grimoire, opening a portal which both her and Abby go through, depositing both in 1781's Sleepy Hollow. And that is it for the weekly TV roundup. Uh, Hopefully we'll be back on Wednesday uh, as normal with uh, the uh, the regular times of the weekly TV roundup. And next Thursday, of course, we'll be doing a video. There's the possibility of a video between between now and Wednesday. We'll see. Uh, As always, feel free to like, share, and subscribe. Uh, You can follow me on social media. The uh, links to both uh, Twitter, Twitter and Facebook are down below in the description. And it's the Rock and Roll Spock signing off, saying, live long, rock hard.